Welcome to Trial Lawyer Review. My name is Jason Lazarus, your host. This podcast is for and about trial lawyers. We'll tell the stories of trial lawyers who go to battle every day in courtrooms throughout the United States for injury victims. And this will be about their stories and about their practices. Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Lazarus, your host for Trial Lawyer View. Thank you for tuning in for another episode. Trial Lawyer View is brought to you by Synergy Settlement Services. In full disclosure, I'm not a professional podcaster. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Synergy Settlement Services. Synergy allows trial lawyers to focus on what they do best by handling the difficult issues at settlement like Medicare compliance, healthcare lien resolution, complex settlement planning, and government benefit preservation. Joining me on Trial Lawyer Review is a products liability guru and preeminent <laughs> trial lawyer, Rich Newsom today. Uh, Rich is uh, someone I'm proud to call a good friend and someone I've worked with for over 20 years. I love working with Rich because he truly cares about his clients and he really cares about the profession. He's done an immense amount of work supporting other trial lawyers. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today, but just a little bit of bio about Rich before we get started. He is the senior partner of the Newsom Melton Law Firm, and they represent people and families in complex civil, civil litigation all across the country. Uh, I know he's a uh, fellow Florida State grad, although his bio just talks about the University of Florida College of Law, where he attended law school. Does it really? Oh, I didn't even know that. <laughs> yeah, there was no mention of Florida State oh, there. So. But he, he is a fellow Noel at heart, I know that. Um, after he graduated from law school, he worked as a federal prosecutor at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Northern and Middle Districts of Florida. Uh, after that, he went on to be a products liability defense lawyer until he saw the light and had a particularly difficult case with a family that um, he, he really felt for and decided at that point, hey, I need to, I need to work for plaintiffs and injury victims. And since then, hasn't looked back. He's got an incredible background. I mean, he's been recognized um, in, in numerous ways, being appointed to, uh, to the uh, Appeals Judicial Nominating Commission. Uh, he's past president of the Orlando Federal Bar Association, past president of the Florida Justice Association past member Board of Governors of the AAJ, past president of the Central Florida Trial Lawyers, uh, a member of ABOTA. So he's, he, he's quite accomplished in the leadership side of, of trial lawyers. Um, he really is someone that I, I, I wanted to have on this podcast because he started something called Trial School, which he talked to me early on about, and I thought it was just a phenomenal idea and a great way of supporting the growth of the profession and helping his fellow trial lawyers. So we're going to talk quite a bit about that today. He's also a member of Summit Council, which is an elite group of trial lawyers across the country. And I want to welcome Rich to Trial Lawyer Review. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me, Jason. I really appreciate it. So before we get into the meat of things, uh, I know that you are an avid fisherman, boater, kite boarder. You spend a lot of time on the water. What do you love so much about that? You know, I, I think doing what we do, there's there's so much stress. I mean, I think most of the trial lawyers that I know have some outlet. Um, you know, <laughs> there's some of our brethren. I mean, you know, you some some love to hunt. Some uh, some love to do marathons. Some, uh, you know, some of our sisters and brothers do other things. But what's great about our community, it seems like we all try to find a way to to escape from. Uh, the, the the stress of representing these people that we care so much about uh, and to be able to forget. And so for me, being out on the water is just a way of that's that's my meditation. You know, when I'm out on the water, it just enables me to you know, try to get closer to nature a little bit and uh, and and stop uh, at least for a little while. Take a take a respite from from the stress and uh, thinking about uh, these cases in our practice for a few minutes. And it's, it's a good help. It's a good way for me to find a good balance, I think. Yeah, healthy balance is, I think, particularly difficult in the profession of, of <laughs> trial lawyers. And, you know, I've, I've had other guests on the show talk about that, trying to find that balance. I know for me, it's cycling and exercise. I used to do a lot of surfing growing up and love being out on the water still. But I, I, I that the idea of kiteboarding 
really just appeals to me, this idea of being able to get onto any wave that you want and also being able to fly. What, what does that feel like? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's so, it's funny, you know, another kiteboarder is Mike Papantonio. He, um, he, he hurt his foot recently, he dropped a kiteboard, I think on his foot, but, uh, oof. but he's, uh, you know, it's, um, so my partner's a surfer, uh, and I know you're a, you're a cyclist, um, but used to be a surfer. And the thing with surfing, you know, you, you maybe get to catch a wave and ride it for maybe 10 seconds if you're being really generous. And, you know, then you got to paddle back out and you're going to miss a couple waves. And so if you're out for a three hour session, you maybe get what, maybe a couple minutes of riding. The nice thing about kiteboarding, at least here in Florida or wherever you go, is you, you know, once you ride, you're, you're up. If the wind's blowing, you're riding. And it's just, uh, it's something that us old guys can do with uh, bad knees and bad joints because uh, even though it looks like some radical, extreme sport you're hooked in the whole time and it takes the weight off your body and just really i mean in terms of connecting to just nature you're there you got to concentrate on driving the boat so to speak which is the kite and the water and your board and so for me it's just a i mean it is complete meditation uh and an escape from uh from this really stressful thing that we do all day in the office yeah so i i mentioned your firm the outset when I was doing your introduction. Can you talk a little bit about your law firm and about your practice in particular? Yeah, and what, one of the great things, and for anyone who actually is watching this, um, Jason has been sort of a, a partner with us in our practice since day one, back when he were, when you and I were uh, babies in our profession. Um, Jason's been with me on almost all of my big cases uh, in terms of, of, of working with our clients. I just, you know, heartfelt thanks. Um, and some of our cases have been kind of dicey. There have been a few times when he's stepped in to, to help a, a settlement from blowing up. And, uh, you know, one of the things about my practice, too, I think you mentioned, you know, my involvement with the civil justice system. You know, so many of us chip in to make sure we're, we're like the, the Dutch boys with our finger in the dike uh, against business and insurance up in Tallahassee and Washington. And Jason, I remember when we had one of our biggest battles in the Thrasher special election several years ago. You and I were out there dropping flyers in Jacksonville, walking door to door at four in the morning. So for anybody who doesn't know that about Jason, he uh, not only uh, works super hard to help our clients, but has been there not just financially, but I mean, he's bled with us. On, we had lost that election, so it was very painful. And he was there, you know, uh, drinking brown water with us the night of of the loss. But um so thanks for all you do and have done, you know, in for the, over the decades. Um, but yeah, so my practice is my, mainly uh, automobile and tire defect work. Where we do some class work too, uh, involving mainly consumer products. Um, but um, yeah, I, I as you said, I, I represented a, a Ford Motor Company after I left the U.S. Attorney's Office, and a family had lost a two-year-old, and we were um, my wife was pregnant with our first child, and I still had student loans and. And finally, was making some money working for this big firm and was taking the deposition of this family. Uh, and it was just heartbreaking. And I called her on the way home and said, man, I can't do this anymore. And she was working for the radio station, you know, in sales, trying to quit her job to try to hopefully uh, raise a family. And, I, you know, and to her credit, she stepped up and she said, all right, you know, I'm, I'm there. And so took a huge cut in pay and uh, started knocking on doors. And, and uh, actually, John Morgan is one of the one of the guys that first started referring me uh, product liability work 25 years ago, and I'll never forget that. But uh, yeah, so that's what I've been doing mainly for the last 25 years is automobile, uh, automobile and tire defect work. We do, we do some other um, complex products work as well, and uh, we do some class action work uh, too, and dabble in mass torts. Uh, but but our our bread and butter is uh, defective products. So, and that type of litigation is is high stakes. It's high cost. It's it's you know, a grind, you're going up against some really big corporate defendants. What, what about that appeals to you? Well, it, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know how this happened. But but since I started doing this, 20, it was it was it was it was expensive 25 years ago, but there's been just the cost creep that has exponentially outgrown um, inflation or anything else. Um, and I think a lot of it is that there are First of all, cars have gotten a lot safer, um, and the systems have become more complex. And so today, um, you know, when I was growing up, uh, vehicles, you know, you, you push in the, the brake, and there's a cable that connects to the brake, or you push the gas, and, and there's a cable that it connects to the accelerometer, you know, the accelerometer, it lets more fuel in the carburetor. 
Today, vehicles are drive by wire. They've become so complicated. When you press a, the gas pedal today, it connects to a, uh, a sensor, and the sensor sends a signal to a computer, and the computer then sends another signal to a server or servo that um, mechanically then operates uh, the, the, the electronic uh, uh, carburetor that will cause the vehicle to go faster. And same with all the systems. You've literally got hundreds of systems in vehicles today Everything from airbags to anti-lock brakes to seat belts, and it's all integrated and sometimes cobbled together from lots of different manufacturers. You know, most of these car companies institutionally were not in the electronics business, and so they pull pieces uh, from different component part manufacturers, and it's kind of a Frankenstein mess of of product, and it works and works most of the time to save lives. But it's gotten so complex that when Glitches happen, and they do, the, the outcomes can be really, really dangerous. But proving that is a lot more complex than it was even 25 years ago. So there's an increased complexity that has caused the cases to become more expensive. Um, but, but having said that, um, the reason I, I love it so much and I, I feel sort of what I was drawn to is because of the difference that we can make. Um, we have had example after example over the 25 years I've been doing this on the plaintiff side, of instances where we've had a case that has resulted in a recall. Uh, a recall that, you know, presumably will save lives. And so it's kind of cool to think that in a very real sense, when we're representing a family and trying to help them get compensation for what has to be, or what, what just because of the economics of these cases, they're so expensive, you can only do a catastrophic case uh, where the damages are huge. But it, it, it gives an opportunity to help more than just that one family because uh, by putting pressure even on you know a case where there's not a recall, it forces over the long term vehicles to become safer and we've seen that. Uh, we've seen it happen when Jason, when you and I first were working on uh, our first cases together back in the day, you know we were doing vehicle rollovers. And our warehouse, we have a, a warehouse um, near um, near our office where we keep all these vehicles, where we store them because they're the evidence in the case. And our vehicles, or our, our warehouse was full of these SUVs that had flipped over. And today, vehicles don't roll over on the road anymore because the manufacturers have designed them to become safer. Uh, they put uh, anti-lock brakes with integrate uh, with uh, lateral accelerometers and they differentially activate the front and the rear tires. And it's amazing, miraculous technology. But I believe that that is in large part to some of that litigation that we and a lot of other great firms across the country did. And I think it's a success that we as the plaintiff's bar can point to collectively uh, to have absolutely saved lives, uh, which, is, which is pretty darn cool. And, you know, one of the things I love about being involved with this aspect of, of lawyering is, is that very fact. And, you know, when I talk to other people who don't really know what trial lawyers do, you know, that, that is such an important service that, you know, saves lives that protects people from companies that make decisions based on profits versus the safety of their customers. And especially with what you do. So it's an incredible, um, privilege and honor for me to be associated with helping those people. Once you do the heavy lifting and secure, a recovery to compensate for you know these these horrible things that un unfortunately happen all too routinely and, and you you see it daily so what well what, uh, well a lot of times let me step in too i mean yeah. I, I you know it's usually a team effort i mean th there's this sort of this whole ecosystem around a catastrophic case you know because i mean to try an automobile defect case today it's going to be around a million dollars in costs the experts, the testing, the Dalbert's all gotten so darn much, so much more complicated than it was. I mean, back in even 20 years ago, it was expensive, but it's gotten worse. Um, but because of the unique nature of these catastrophic cases, and you know this because you're part of it, there's not just the plaintiff's firm handling the litigation. There's, like I said, sort of this ecosystem uh, of of the the structured settlement people that integrate with the life care planners. You know, you have someone with a catastrophic brain injury, for example it requires help. You know, how are we going to get this person the care they need just to get to the trial? And so that's one of the things that I think is also kind of cool about our community and this work that we do, unlike the folks on the defense side that, you know, are just worried about litigating the case. We're trying to worry about how, you know, you've got a, a family, for example, with a mother who's in the hospital 
you know, with this catastrophic brain injury, they don't know where the, how they're going to get their bills paid. How are they going to get her into a rehab facility? How, you know, the hospital's kicking them out because maybe they only have Medicaid. They don't know what to do. And I know that's something you guys have helped us with, but there's others as well. And then to understand, you know, what is the story behind this product? Why did it happen? There's other folks that have their, you know, their, their fingers deep into the government research to understand the bigger picture. So it's just, to me, that's really rewarding to be part of a bigger community that's not just, yes, our firm plays a huge part in prosecuting one of these cases, but you, you, you know, your firm, Synergy, and others, you know, our experts, our consultants, it really is kind of a, a, a community project to move one of these cases, you know, from right after the crash to, to how is this family going to make it through the litigation and survive um, until hopefully we can get them comp uh, compensation. And, you know, I mean, that was sort of my uh, vision for Synergy was, you know, becoming a resource for trial lawyers mm -hmm. when all of these issues have become much more complex. Medicare, oh, man. liens, uh, preservation of government benefits that are mm -hmm. needs based, the, the settlement planning aspects of it. You know, there's so many complexities. I mean, we, we have so many subject matter experts now that are, you know, incredible thought leaders in these different niche areas that yep. are all things that trial lawyers used to handle, but now it's gotten to the point where, yeah. you know, you, you could commit malpractice if, if you don't have the right people working with you. And I mean, it's incredible that, you know, the teams that are put together in some of these bigger cases. Well, it really, you know, and, and, and I think that's, that's another thing. And you know this cause you work with the firms that handle these, but it really is a team approach today. It has gotten so darn much harder, uh, on, on the complicated cases, especially with, you know, even, even the, the healthcare systems themselves. I mean, how many times Jason have we seen where we get a call and it's a catastrophic case and, uh, the family's literally getting kicked out of the, uh, uh, of the, of the hospital. And they have nowhere to go. And this person may be on a respirator and they're being, you know, basically kicked out and told, oh, by the way, go back to your apartment with your wife and three kids and you're on a respirator, you know, with no money. Yeah. And, you know, it's just um, and that's that's the part that a lot of the public doesn't think about. When you think about a trial lawyer, you think, oh, you know, they're going to help me with my claim and with filing a lawsuit against whatever car company or whatever insurance company or trucking company. But, man, there's that whole human side. And, you know, and then there's the empathy that goes along with it. And then once they are home, um, who's going to manage that, manage all the care, the therapy, like you said, the Medicare, the, 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 the coverages, it is just, um, it's gotten really, I think not only more expensive, but more complicated and, um, but also equally rewarding when you, when you, know, you were there, especially when you come out the other side of that process. Uh, with a family that, you know, called you and they were just desperate where they couldn't even think about how to get through tomorrow, much less how to get their loved one out of the hospital and get them home. And now you've not only helped them through that process, but you've prosecuted this case. You've answered the questions. You've found, you know, the betrayal of some company that caused this predictable loss. And then you've gotten a recovery that, that's life changing for them. You know, um, and then can maybe also give them hope that, okay, because of this fight that we went through, not only we helped our family, but maybe we've made a difference for other families and we're going to make sure that, you know, this, this corporation thinks twice or maybe even changes their product or their policy so that it doesn't happen to more people. That's pretty darn cool. And it doesn't happen every day, you know, but boy, when it does, it's pretty darn uh, incredible. Yeah, you know, I mean, e even though um, my accident, I know you, you know, about that, you know, even though when I was in an accident, it pales in comparison to what most of the clients you represent went through, I realized just how little I even knew and how little power I had in that whole process. So it really, you know, unfortunately opened my eyes in a way that um, I think has helped me become better with our company and trying to make sure everybody here understands just how important it is, what we do every day, how it impacts lives, how it helps protect people and all those things that, you know, are, are so critical that a company like ours and people like you care about because that's how those people can move on from what's probably been the most catastrophic thing that's happened in their entire lives. Right. And, and until you've been through it, you know, either yourself, like you went through with your crash, 
you know, or have literally held the hand in the hospital, you know, because a lot of times you'll get the call from a client and, you know, maybe it's a referral or whatever, and they are literally still in the hospital and doctors are telling them, you know, giving them advice on whether to pull the plug. Um, and, you know, they don't know what to do. And so you've got to talk to these people in this time of crisis. We're not trained for that as lawyers. Um, uh, but over time, you know, having done it enough, um, you can't even imagine um, just as a, as a new lawyer um, what that means. And so it's really been kind of cool to watch the evolution of our industry, our plaintiff industry grow, um, not only in terms of sort of the law firm's abilities to help with this, but to, to, I mean, in particular, sort of the support, the peripheral support organizations like yours. You know, gosh, when you got started, when you and I first started working together, you were doing structured settlements. And then by necessity, oh, well, Jason, well, can you help us with um, helping find, uh, you know, care for this person? And how are we going to get the care paid for? How are we going to transport? I think you helped. There was a case we had. They were getting, our family was getting kicked out of a hospital in Alabama. They were Florida. And, you know, you worked with us, and it was, you know, one of our paralegals to just find transportation, medical transportation, to bring them out of the hospital to, to their house where, Again, we had to get a social worker together to even help coordinate the care. The catastrophic care in these cases has become uh, a lot harder, but the good news is, like I said, I mean, especially your group and some others have really uh, risen to the task to support us. And so, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool to have watched that uh, sort of transform over the last 20 years. I love how you mentioned empathy. That's one of our, our corporate values. And that's one of the reasons I said at the outset, what I said about you is I, I see how you care about your client and the empathy. And that's, to me, a very important part of all of what we do that relates to people that have been through this. Because, you know, if, if you're not empathetic to someone that's been through some of the stuff that that you see, that we see, it's, you know, I, I mean, it, it really is life altering kinds of things. And, you know, it, it, you have to, you have to try to put yourself in that person's place, you know, if they've lost a loved one or they have right. a loved one that's now brain injured or in a wheelchair or burned horribly, it's just, man. And we're not trained for that, right? We come out of law school you know, I had a political science degree for God's sake, you know, and uh, then I've been a federal prosecutor, and so now all of a sudden you're meeting with this family that lost a child. You know, yeah. We have zero training for that. Uh, one of the greatest experiences in my career was when um, Mel Orchard, uh, uh, who's the uh, great friend out in um, Wyoming, invited me and kind of coerced me into going to the Jerry Spence Trollers College. I had been you know, practicing you know, 25 years at that point, and I thought I was pretty good. And you know, he said, no, man, you got to work on the horse. And I'm like, all right. And, and he really kind of guilted me into going. I went because I love Mel, and he's very persuasive. And, man, it was awesome because what they really teach methodically. And, look, you know, I, 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 I think I try to be empathetic with the clients, but they teach a method specifically training lawyers to be empathetic uh, through a process called psychodrama. And, man, it was transformative. And I really wish that I had done that 20 years ago. And so, um, but, you know, again, this is um, something Spence created 20 years ago. Uh, he created this place where people could go. There's, you know, various spinoff organizations. But I think as our profession continues to evolve, to evolve, I think hopefully that's something that we will continue to get better at as well, which is training young lawyers on this variety of skill sets that it takes beyond just what you learned in law school, of how to try a case, what is an opening, what is a closing, what is discovery. On our side, especially in these death cases or catastrophic injury cases, or even when someone's got a neck surgery, that is just, I mean, we're, we're, not, we're not trained. And uh, I think what's really cool to see the plaintiff bar do is to try to evolve, not in whole cloth, but certainly segments of our community that have risen to this idea that we need to do a better job in teaching empathy and teaching connection. Uh, and then obviously working with groups like yours to actually be more than just a firm that's going to file a claim and litigate. So you talked about the case that sort of led you to make that hard decision to start doing plaintiff work, you know, which is always a financially hard decision, but is there uh, an important or influential case that you've handled and you know, why, why do you view it as such a, a particular case other than that one or, or is that the one? 
Yeah, no, I mean, that was, I, I was on the defense on that side. Um, soon after I left, I guess, sort of my transformation, I joined a, a guy, it was a great guy named John Overchuck, but he had a small firm and had done some product liability. But soon after, um, again, and I think to me, um, it's this notion of community that we, it, you know, it, you know, is the whole, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to prosecute a significant case. Um, and, and my first exposure to that idea uh, was in the Firestone litigation. So I was invited, you know, or to actually by my partner said, hey, go to this. We had some, we had, we had a tire failure involving this Firestone tire. This is gosh, 20 years ago. And I'd been doing some products and Morgan had started sending me a few cases and I was, you know, knocking on doors of other trial lawyers that didn't want to screw around with Sue and Bridgestone. And so I had this case where, um, it was this Firestone tire. And so my partner said, Hey, go to this AIG, the attorney's information exchange group, which was a sub and Jason, you've been a big supporter of AIG. I know Marcy uh, Gordon goes, but it was, um, a relatively new group at the time. And they were sharing information on defective products. And it was a subset of, of Atla, the old, um, AAJ that had its own staff, its own warehouse. And the idea is that this is a group of plaintiff lawyers that would share information, share documents, share information about experts uh, on vehicle defect cases. So I went and uh, there was a, a breakout on these Firestone tires. And, you know, the question was, hey, show of hands, who has, uh, you know, a Cooper tire case? You know, there's two or three hands that went up. And there were a lot of people in this room. There's like 45, 50 people there. This was in Washington. And um, it's back in 2000. And anybody here have a Dunlop case? One or two hands. Anybody have a Michelin couple? Anybody have a Firestone ATX? whoosh, almost every hand in the room went up. And it was sort of this moment of stunned silence. Everyone looked at each other. And so we decided to get together and a group of us said, okay, why don't we all throw in some dollars and do some research? And we hired a friend and this is this notion of community. Um, and uh, we hired a guy just to start digging. Um, he was not a testifying expert, but he was a very, very good research guy. And I remember it was the night before uh, I was in the office on a Sunday night uh, there alone because my wife was, we were going to have our, our son was going to be born soon and she was going to be induced like the next day. So I'm there at 10 o'clock and my phone rings. It's a Sunday night. What the hell? And it's, it's my buddy who was doing the research. You're not going to believe it. They recalled it in Venezuela. He said, buckle up. Um, Public Citizen's going to do a press release on it the next day. And so sure enough, Joan Claybrook did an announcement course, um, all hell broke loose after that. And it was at the time, the largest recall in history. And it was all because a group of five plaintiff firms got together and shared information cooperatively with each other and resulted in this massive change. And it resulted in the tread act, which made tires safer, improved uh, reporting and really changed the way that the government handled recalls. And that was the first time that I was really exposed to the power of that. Uh, of course, a group of us work together to compile information and, and prosecute those cases. Um, but so for me, that was that was the game changer. And that really helped expose me to this idea that we can make a huge difference uh, through our individual cases. Uh, you've been a leader amongst trial lawyers ever since I've known you in Florida and beyond. What's driven you in that regard? It's just, you know, it's um, what's driven me. You know, I, I love not only do I, I love our clients and this idea that we can really help human beings when they're in this just terrible circumstance. It's so hard. I met with some clients this morning that lost two children in a crash. And I told them, I said, how do I, I said, I've been doing this a long time and I've had this conversation. I, I don't know what to say other than I'm going to try to do everything I can to help you. Um, and, and the other piece of it too is I love the plaintiff's bar. I love plaintiff lawyers. I love our community. They are, you know, we are this group of women and men who are kind of gunslinger, badasses. Um, you know, we cuss, you know, we take risks. Um, we go down improbably crazy paths to try to get justice for our clients, you know, and I just love now, look, not there's obviously exceptions um, to that. But as, as a general rule, my, my best friends are plaintiff lawyers. And I've gotten to know them through doing this thing that we all do together. And, you know, um, 
I just, I, I love our group. You know, I've, I've made certain decisions in my career. I'm, I'm certainly, you know, not the most financially successful guy, but I will die happy knowing that I have really had the chance to work with and become friends with some really great people uh, doing what we all care about, which is trying to help uh, these people find help. So it's pretty cool. So let's talk about trial school, because that's sort of that perfect segue. I remember uh, sitting down and talking about this idea that you had when it uh, was yep. at its infancy. So you were there at the beginning, you and Marcy. Yeah. What is trial school? So it all started, um, Mel Orchard and I were at um, a summit council meeting five years ago, maybe six years ago now. And uh, we were talking about jury selection and Alex Alvarez was there and I was bragging on Alex's method. Um, he had come up with this really revolutionary way of, of, of picking juries. And Mel was talking about his, he was actually given a, a TLC, Trollers College. Mel is a faculty member there. He's a managing partner of Spence's law firm. And Mel had given a demonstration on the TLC tribe building method, which I'd never really been exposed to. I'd heard about it, ah, TLC's this cult, whatever. But I saw this thing, I saw Mel demonstrate this thing. I was like, wow, that's powerful. So he and I, after this, you know, something, I'm like, man, this is how, and I brought Alex in, he's like, this is how we do it. And Mel's like, this is how, I'm like, he's like, you gotta come to TLC. And that was kind of the beginning. So I go out there and I, I was exposed through Joey Lowe and Mel uh, and, and, and participated in learning that method. And I thought, wow, this was, super powerful and i'm talking to joe i'm like well alex alvarez does this thing we have this jay burke guy that does cause and there's this method that burke uses and joey Lowe's like ah that's bullshit <laughs> wait a minute hold on it's, no it's not bullshit there's been some incredible verdicts that you know chris cersei and and yared have used burke and i've had some success and so i go back home and i call mitnick i'm like hey man they, you know, you, I got to tell you about this thing that I learned. We went to lunch and I was telling about this tribe building thing. And Mitnick's like, yeah, it's bullshit. I'm like, Come on, man. No, it's not. And so I, I sponsored, I said, well, why don't everybody get together? So we had some of the greatest lawyers um, on voir dire come from across the country. Johnny Zelps came and, and Joey Lowe, Mel Orchard came. Uh, we had Jonathan Colvin. Some of the other TLC guys came. Uh, and then we had um, Mark Aver was there. Uh, uh, Mitnick, of course, uh, Alex Alvarez, and uh, I think uh, Brian uh, McLean was there from Morgan. And, and we mashed up. We, I brought in some bunch of focus groups over a couple days, and we mashed up voir dire, and we, we've compared notes and, and talked about method. And not everyone was convinced. Some of us were, but um, I think now that there's, a, there's, a collect, there's, I think, more of a consensus. There, there is a way to combine method. And so we started having more workshops and then live streaming not just ways to combine methodology on jury selection, but on other things. And it was really started as a laboratory of ideas through collaboration. How can we as a community put down our paywalls or our egos about how great our method is and share with each other better ways to try cases? Because obviously there's been an evolution in, uh, in our juries and our court system. Juries today aren't the same as they were 20 years ago. Um, methods have gotten better. And so that's what, that's what started. We just started calling it trial school. We started meeting in our warehouse. Jason, you were there. Marcy was there. We, then we started live streaming. This was two, three, four, four years ago now. And it started to get momentum. It was mainly with some Summit Council lawyers that were sharing methods. Johnny Gomez was one of our early live streams where he was combining different methods for opening statements, for example, to combine not just, you know, so many of us use the, you know, would use one method or another, but Gomez was really trying to exercise well, how can we combine different methods and, and break it down. And so the idea became, we started calling it MMA, you know, back in the early days of, and I've, I've you know, I've talked about this before, but when um, Ultimate Fighting started, it was originally a contest between uh, what martial arts method was the best. Was it uh, kickboxing, was it Muay Thai, was it grappling? And of course this kid, Hoist Gracie, this is back in the early nineties, whipped everyone's ass using Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That really was sort of an obscure sport at that point. And he killed everyone for a couple, three years until the other fighters started to learn the other methods. And eventually got to the point where it is today, where if you can't strike and kick and grapple, you are going to get your ass beat because the mixed method approach is the only way to win. So the, you know, we started calling it MMA, mixed method advocacy, right? The idea is that we can, we can form a, a better way and, and discover state-of-the-art trial practices 
by exposing each other to these various messages. And, and since then, we've come up with some spectacular discoveries. You know, I heard Joe Freed was, was trying cases faster. So I called him up. He's on our faculty. And I, he said, you know, so when we talked about it, and I said, man, we ought to call that speed trial and start teaching. He's like, yeah, I like that idea. And so we did a program. We kind of, uh, I made him write it down. And then I kind of, re- anyway, long story short, that's a great discovery. That's a great method. We learned uh, from Texas. They have a very different way. It's another piece of the voir dire system. They have a scoring method that was originally developed by an inner circle uh, member who, who passed away. Jim Perdue Jr., though, has, has shared that and kind of brought that to light. Lisa Blue shared that, too. And there's more. I mean, I could, I could go on and on. But what's really been great, I think, is that through collaboration, we have discovered better method. And then we've, we've today become this thing where we've built a library. The idea is, why don't we put it all online and we'll make it only accessible for lawyers who only represent people or public interest groups, right? The good guys, the white hats. And let's make it available for free forever, so we'll never charge for it because the lawyers, the idea was that some of the lawyers that need this stuff the most can't afford to pay 3000 or $5,000 and go here, you know, some great lawyer in Atlanta, you know, they can't afford that. They don't have the time. They don't have the money. So we're going to make it available uh, completely for free forever uh, till the cows come home. And so we have it all on this great website. Uh, it's all there, kind of like master class, where you can just ring it up when you need it in the fog of war, when time is short, you know, and you're writing up, you're, you're, you're freaking out before trial. And that's another thing that we're also um, trying to roll out more is to talk about fear. That's a thing that everybody's too cool to talk about most of the time, now with, with rare exceptions. But um, that's another thing, because one of the things we've seen is so many lawyers, and I have, sh- you know, look, I, I still get nervous as hell. I get performance anxiety. Good news, there are practical ways to deal with it. Uh, practice and, and, and repetition is the most important. But that's another thing that we're, I mean, Chris Stombaugh, the great Chris Stombaugh, who is a former reptile instructor. He was Don Keenan's partner. He's also a former TLC instructor. And Chris has sort of um, delved down in the, the deep, dark arts of, of state, uh, which is incredibly effective. Uh, and we're gonna have some other pr- uh, people, but but uh, but so we're we're dealing with topics that maybe are a little bit far afield from what are traditional uh, trial advocacy uh, approaches. You know, most trial advocacy programs have always been, you know, usually one of it's a pay per play specific method that one guy came up with, and it's his method, and you're gonna go learn it, or it's an AAJ or an FJA type program where. It's whoever has given money to the PAC this year or is buddies with the CLA program. There's really not a, a coherent uh, program or, or curriculum or NIDA. And NIDA's great, but NIDA's generic, and it's not specific to our industry. Uh, and it's not sort of state-of-the-art plaintiff method for winning plaintiff cases or personal injury cases. And so, um, so that's what trial school has become is to try to become – I really think you know we're growing like crazy. We're closing in on 4,000 members now. Uh, I think we'll be over 10,000 members um, within the next few years. We hope to co- fundamentally change the um, the way that CLE is done. We're going to make it free uh, forever. Uh, we've got sponsors now. I know you guys are, I mean, like people throwing in like big dollars to make this happen. We've got some amazing uh, sponsors. We've got professional staff now. And so uh, it's really cool. And I, you know, I hope that where this is going to go, that it's going to continue to be a vehicle that we can continue to discover and evolve best methods, state-of-the-art methods for trial advocacy over time because it does change. You, know, you look at the way Mo Levine used to try cases back in the 1960s. You couldn't, do, you couldn't get away with that shit today. You know, but there are some really equally great methods that do work today, and uh, hopefully we'll keep talking about them. So. I think you, you've kind of danced around this. I, I don't know if you were a, a Simon Sinek fan, but th- this idea of the why for you, what is the why behind trial school and why is it so important to you? Cause I know it's important to you. Yeah. I mean the why initially, cause I wanted to get better. I mean, there was a, I got my ass beat in a case up in the panhandle and it, it was, it, it's still painful. It is by far the most painful thing that ever happened. It was a case where a 19 year old, Jason, you were involved in this early. We tried, this was that case with David Frank and it was up in the panhandle and uh, I was feeling pretty cocky about myself as a trial lawyer, and I went up there and I was asking for all this money and I got poured out. Um, and it was in the panhandle and uh, it was a case that I should not have lost. 
and man, it, it just killed me. And I lost a lot of nerve, man. I, I, I thought, man, if I, if I lose this case, I was clearly doing something wrong. And so that was kind of what started me down the journey of under, that's why I went to the trial of scholars, other than Mel guilting me into it. But I wanted to learn why did this happen? And I suspected it was dry. I absolutely know why it was now. And I would never make that mistake, the mistakes I made in that case. So for me, it was initially a way to overcome. I had lost my confidence, had lost my nerve. I had huge, I had tried some cases since that case, but man, I was really struggling with anxiety because I didn't feel like I had the best methods. And it was a really, it was, it was a horrible loss. Um, and so for me, that's what started me on this journey was to try to understand how can I deal with my personal weaknesses as a trial lawyer, my personal fears, and to understand the best ways of doing this. And so, and then, and then just the love of doing it. I mean, it's just kind of cool when you start learning all these new gems and the relationships with the other lawyers, the other faculty members, and being able to get the, you know, the completely unexpected reward of getting an email from some lawyer I've never met saying, hey, man, this was really helpful to me. It helped me in my case. I mean, it's just been like win, win, win across the board. So, yeah. So, but what drove me initially to do it was uh, a loss, a horrible, painful, soul-breaking loss uh, where I didn't, you know, I didn't do the best job I probably could have done had I known better. So how do lawyers that are interested in get involved in trial school and why is it so important to them in their practices? I mean, I think you've sort of laid that out, but if you want to, you know, zero in on that. Yeah, it's super easy. You just go to trialschool.org. Um, we have, uh, we copied the A from AIEG. Um, we have a, um, a joint prosecution agreement. Uh, we have uh, an affidavit that you have to sign that's saying you only represent people. And by the way, we've, we've discovered some, some defense lawyers trying to sneak in. And so um, we That's have right. em Emily uh, Valdez as our membership director. We vet every single person. We go to their website, we check references, and if there's ever a question, we double down and double check. We, so Because we wanted to create this safe place where people could share secret sauce and not end up you know, seeing it like happens on some of the TLALs where there's a printout in a hearing, hey, judge, he said this, you know, at a, at a, you know the listserv, we've all seen that happen. So we've tried to make it somewhat bulletproof to the as best degree we can. Andrew Finkelstein actually was huge help. He and Mike Erner um, came in um, early and said, hey, man, this thing needs to be ro more robust. You guys are really – and Mike Erner had ripped a whole copy of all of our videos. He had just hacked right through it. And so we've got this pretty good uh, backbone. So, that, But if you want to join, just go fill out the affidavit. You've got to list your bar number and know that you know we will grieve you if we catch you <laughs> sneaking in. Um, and it's that easy. And then we approve you and you're in for life. Uh, well, as long as you don't represent bad guys. Um, so yeah, so that's it. And then, you know, you can access all the videos. We have constantly upgraded, uh, programs that we're doing all the time. We've got some really sick stuff rolling out in the next six months. Uh, we have a very active, uh, listserv just saw, you know, last night, uh, Jim Purdue senior, um, posted a whole unpublished book on storytelling for trial lawyers. It was just badass, like for free on the listserv. Um, and that kind of stuff happens frequently. Um, we're in, you know, so we have a private Facebook group. I just saw, you know, just today, two new videos got posted. We're having a secret sauce contest right now, uh, where, you know, members just with their iPhone can re record a trial tip or whatever. And we're giving away a bunch of big ass prizes to try to coax people into doing it. Um, so yeah, so if you are, if you're, anyone's listening to this and you only represent people join, uh, you'll benefit. And then once hopefully COVID is done. We'll start having in-person retreats again, where we actually work with each other in small groups to stand up, get on your feet, practice with coaches where you're videotaped and, you know, Josh Carton, uh, come in and, you know, teach you these crazy exercises to make you, make you get out of your skin and learn empathy. So it's fun, but we'll, you know, so join it's free. If you're, if you're listening and have any interest. Are there any specific future plans about trial school that you want to share with anybody that might be listening? Yeah. So, um, you know, once we, uh, once we get past COVID, we hope to start having retreats again, uh, in person, uh, where we have, that was, you know, how it started, right. Where we, we have speakers come in to share methodology and then to train our members where we, you know, break up into small groups and we work kind of like a, a modified NIDA program where we videotape each other and we give feedback. We did the last one, uh, Marcy Gordon was there in Arizona. And I mean, the feedback we got just was extraordinary because we're not just talking theory. Uh, we're not just talking, you know, where you listen to a lecture. 
we do that, but then we follow up by sending you home. And the, you know, the only uh, criticizing when we wore people out uh, because you know we'd start in the morning, and and then the, you know we would have these sort of these group conversations about method that would go late, and then there, the students were supposed to then go home and prepare to get on their feet the next day, and to practice it in small groups with mock panels of other students, uh, with with faculty coaches. Um, but we'll definitely be doing that again uh, for sure. And I think that now because we've grown so much, there's going to be a lot more interest and hopefully involvement. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's kind of exciting to, to get to work with each other face-to-face -face again. So uh, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about kind of the business side of the practice of law. For you, what is the biggest market disruption you see coming in personal injury mm -hmm. law practice? You know, and, and this is no secret. Everyone knows this in our space. There's been a continued consolidation uh, of big firms getting bigger. Um, you know, my, my dear friend, John Morgan, uh, who I love, and I think is one of the most brilliant guys out there. You know, I, you know, I was, I, I first met him when he had eight lawyers here in Orlando and yeah. you know, they're probably up to 800, uh, and they're great. They're great lawyers and they do a great job. Um, there is also, uh, as, as we all know too, um, there are the case aggregators that have gotten involved. And I think one of the real big disruptive things that I still have yet to fully appreciate how it's going to unfold, uh, but is this um, beginning of the non-lawyer law firm. Uh, I know Arizona just flipped the switch to allow non-lawyers to participate in fees, and what that's enabled uh, is, is hedge funds and, and Wall Street money to get poured into advertising campaigns. And so I think, I fear, you know, we've, we've been on the slippery slope for a while uh, where there were the... Um, the, the referring, you know, what do they call it? The, not the case aggregators, the um, lawyer referral services. Yeah. The lawyer referral services. And I think that's going to continue. Yep, exactly. So it's the corporatization of law firms that represent people. And, and what we have all seen, and everyone knows this is it becomes less about individual human beings and trial lawyers representing them to a jury of their peers and uh, about business. And we've seen these, these, you know, uh, to various degrees, but but mass settlements um, that are sometimes good, but so many times there are by these case aggregators that are never have never tried a case, are not trial, real trial lawyers that refer to their clients as inventory, not as not as people. And to me, it's not the big firms that are growing that actually have real trial, trial lawyers representing people. That's not the problem. It's corporate money infusing into to to you know develop inventories of of human beings and selling their cases for cheap because what we've all seen for years is young lawyers who are scared or underfunded settling cases ch more cheaply but at least those lawyers know their clients uh, but now we've got cases settled based on a matrix and a grid and um you know i know that that's primarily just been in the mass tort world but where does that go next where does that go for regular single event cases. So I think, I think this is, you know, over my career, we've seen, you know, first it was the growth of advertising firms that have gotten bigger and bigger, but now we're seeing, I think, a, a, a more sinister potential of corporate hedge fund money coming in and um, corporatizing uh, our, our, our clients. And I don't know where that's gonna end, but it, it sure feels dangerous to me. Uh, and I, I know that a lot of the buzz in the, mar the legal marketing community is excited about that because for the first time, these non-lawyers um, are, are looking to, to get into the business. And of course, they don't have ethical requirements. They don't give a, they care about money, but they don't care about the clients. And that's, that is worrisome. So don't know where that's going to go, but I think that's going to be the biggest game changer. And I think we're going to start seeing that now more with Arizona. And I, I've heard that Utah's maybe getting into it too. And I, I just, I, I think that's going to continue to, I don't know if there's anything to, to stop it, but that's why I think if we as trial lawyers can continue to be excellent at our craft, there will always be a foil by example. So that in other words, if we are willing to still try cases uh, and get results, it's going to press against the sort of the, the cheap settlements, which is the real risk. Uh, you know, people settling human beings cases for a fraction of what they're worth because they're going to get compared to verdicts. So I think as long as we as trial lawyers are willing to go to the courtroom and press, take risks for our clients, 
I think, I think, you know, the story has yet to be told. And so there's hope. And I think that there is, um, as long as there are real trial lawyers who know how to try cases, I think, um, I think, you know, we're still in the fight, so to speak. From a business aspect, what is the most important thing for lawyers to understand about operating law firm? You, you've got a fairly significant operation. Um, just curious about you know, what you would share with other lawyers or a lawyer that maybe is contemplating starting a firm. You know, boy, I'm, I'm sure not the best guy to talk about that. I've missed out on opportunities. If I could do it all over again, I probably would have done it differently. I, I've been more focused on just, you know, my single event uh, trial practice. I'm not the best guy. You know, there are some really great mentors in that space, though. Um, you know, Andrew Finkelstein, for example, uh, he's one of uh, the, the founding firms of, of trial school. He's just starting uh, a class. Uh, he's only going to take like 30 students a year, but where he's going to mentor them, it's going to be a class for uh, the business of law to help small firms and medium sized firms learn how to get better. Um, you know, there's the whole, uh, fireproof, uh, group that just started. Um, they are absolutely amazing. Um, and they are teaching lawyers, uh, about the business of law. You know, there are others, there are other groups out there that do, I think a good job, but I, I'm not that guy. I'm not the business guy. I've made, if I've made different decisions, I'd be a lot richer guy than I am now. Um, so, uh, but you know, I, I think there's, you know, if you're a young lawyer though, uh, do Google fireproof, uh, uh, com, I think, or fireproof lawyer. That's a consulting firm. Uh, talk to Andrew Finkelstein or, or apply, go to trialschool.org and apply for that class. Um, and there are others, you know, there are other business groups, uh, that, that you might mogul, uh, with crisp communications. They have a really nice, uh, business, uh, counseling mentor group. Uh, so, but, but I'm not that guy, <laughs> so, but there's hope for folks who, who do want to learn how to be better. So you guys do a great job marketing. I'm, I'm curious, what, what do you think is sort of the most important thing these days in marketing your practice? You know, again, I'm, I'm not, uh, know thyself, right? And uh, I am not the best marketer out there. Um, I have failed miserably in hindsight with, you know, how I would have done things differently. But, you know, for me, it's just all about relationships. We build relationships with other trial lawyers because almost 100% of my cases come from other trial lawyers. Uh, and I, you know, because I, and, and for me, that's easy. I, what I enjoy is, is I like other trial lawyers. Uh, I like single event cases and our firm has just grown into, you know, we start, we, John Morgan generously, uh, for 20 years referred me all of his product liability uh, cases. Uh, and then they just finally started doing it themselves. Um, uh, but, um, but, but that's been my business model, uh, is I just, I, I try to do a good job. I have really good relationships with, uh, other lawyers, you know, recently it's been come, become helping other lawyers pick juries or try cases that aren't just product liability. Um, but, but yeah, so for me, it's about relationships and just want, you know, friends. So, um, again, marketing, I, 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 I'm, I'm not the, that's, that's certainly not my forte and I'm not very good at it, but you know, I, I have good relationships. So fortunately that's, that's been enough. So, and, and I've seen those relationships that you have with other lawyers when you've worked with other lawyers on cases I've been involved with. Is that what you would credit the success for you and your firm on those, that, that ability to connect and work with other trial lawyers? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, um, that's been my whole practice is working in co-counsel relationships with other trial lawyers, 100%. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, there may be two pieces of case. There could be a BI claim, for example, with maybe, you know, like a hundred policy, but a potential multi-million dollar damages model or damages case. And sometimes the, the product liability case is the only way that the client's ever going to even hope to have their life care plan funded. And so in those contexts, you know, we won't touch the BI. I mean, that's our co-counsel's relationship. The other thing we've done, the other thing I think value in addition to obviously hopefully getting good results for the clients that our, our referral friends uh, bring us in, you know, we, we're sort of like the product liability division uh, for, some, for, for most of the firms we work with, where we not only make sure that we help them screen potential cases, um, get good recoveries, but one of the biggest services that we provide is to keep them out of trouble. You know, in a complex, and Jason, you know this, you've seen it in a complex products case, um, there is the potential to create legal malpractice really easily. And it has to do with everything from failing to timely preserve evidence, to preserve a crash scene, 
uh, to to not identifying all of the parties. I mean, I've I've seen it at least sadly at least a couple times a year. I'll get a call. Hey, man, I know you do products. Can you be an expert witness? This firm didn't preserve evidence, or they didn't bring in the right party. And my heart sinks. I, I've never testified uh, in a legal malpractice case, and I never will because I love the plaintiff's bar, and it's so easy to make those kinds of mistakes. And I've made mistakes over the years for damn sure. I mean, I've learned all my <laughs> lessons. A lot of our procedures are from screwing things up. Um, so it, it's, it's, but that's an unfortunate reality. When you've got a catastrophic case, it's really easy to, to misstep if you don't do it every day. It's why I don't do medical malpractice. Yeah. Um, we, we just, you know, I, we refer all that out to other friends, uh, because, you know, if you don't do it every day, there's just ways to screw it up. And so that's, that's a service we provide, uh, to, to our friends, which I think is why there's good synergy, <laughs> not to use the term, but, uh, with our firm and others. Yeah. It's, it's our business, our business model, right? right. You know, we're the Medicare compliance department for law yep. firm. We're the, for us, you are for us and, and yeah. have been and have been for 20 years. And yeah. And I guess that's, you know, that the, the, it's funny the, 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 term though, that, that really sums it up nicely. We synergize is like I said at the beginning, it's, it's to me, what we do, especially in these catastrophic cases, it is a village effort. It's your firm. It's our referring attorneys. It's the other experts we work with, not just the testifying experts, but the other people like, you know, my, my great friend, Sean Kane, who has been like, uh, you know, he is, I, we consider him part of our firm because I will not do a big case without Sean's help. He's that good. And so if anyone has a product like, and by the way, that's the other thing too. Uh, someone once told me when I was getting into this, oh, I'm not sure how to do a plaintiff case. If you as a young lawyer want to handle a complex case, be a product liability case or a med mal case, you can absolutely do it. Don't be dissuaded because of the potential complexity. As long as you're willing to bleed for the client and to put in the elbow grease and the late nights, it will take that. Now, once you sort of get over the learning curve, it won't take as much, but you know, that is the glorious thing about what we do. It is something that any lawyer who's willing to put in the time can figure out. And there's ways to figure out the finances. There's ways. Yeah, there's risks. I mean, there's one, Jason, you remember that Simide trial, you were involved in this. Um, it was an airbag case shortly after my old partner left. And, and uh, I was basically, it was me and a, a young associate went down. If I lost that case, you know, I was, I was bankrupt. Um, but, um, but if you believe in your case and you do your homework, you, you know, you can take those risks and damn sure win for your clients. So that's the other thing. You don't have to uh, just refer everything out. I encourage young lawyers, if you've got a case and you believe that, you know, you want to handle this and you're willing to work for it, do it. You can absolutely make it happen. Well, that's a, that's a great place to end. Thank you, Rich, for being a guest today and hope to have everybody back on the next episode of Trial Lawyer Review. Well, Jason, thanks again for your friendship all these years. I mean, you know how much we lean on you guys in all of our cases. And uh, it was really a pleasure being on you today. It was a treat to be uh, your guest on your podcast. And uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Rich. All right. Thanks for tuning in to Trial Lawyer Review. You can find more at triallawyerreview.com and look for more episodes and more content coming in the future.